Welcome to Blends in Maple. Uh, this is joint work with Eric Postma and I'm Rob Corliss. So, what is a blend? Well, it's a combination of Taylor polynomials for the same function at one end of an interval and the other end of an interval. More details can be found on our paper on the archive. So if you have that Taylor polynomial at one end of the interval and at the other end of the interval, you might like to combine that information because you hope to improve the accuracy. This is a kind of interpolation. Uh, the data is, of course, the values of the derivatives at either end. We find it convenient to divide by the factorial. So we look at the Taylor coefficients themselves, call them big P and big Q here. This can be generalized in a various ways. The most straightforward is just an ordinary Hermit interpolation across an interval at multiple points. But we might be more interested in piecewise Hermit interpolants, and that's uh, my interest. Uh, there's generalizations to rational interpolants and lots of other kinds of things. I could remind you about Taylor series and Taylor polynomials in Maple, but I'm going to leave that for your own exploration on this section. This workbook is uh, made available to you. So, so some applications of blends. Uh, my main interest is in solving ordinary differential equations numerically. I use uh, Taylor series methods or what are called Hermita Breshkov methods. You can use blends for quadrature. I'll show you how. You can use them to approximate functions. Uh, a blend is a simple polynomial and so it's easy to evaluate. You can also use uh, this as a technique for root finding for nonlinear functions. And the best way to do that, I think, is by what's known as a companion matrix eigenvalue. I won't talk about that today. There are some interesting pedagogical applications. If you want to strengthen the notion of convergence, this is a nice way to do this. So it was a, an application in a calculus class. And in linear algebra, you would use the companion matrix that I just mentioned. If you're teaching complex variables, the derivation of the formula for uh, Hermite interpolants is a beautiful example of the residue theory. If you're teaching numerical analysis, the quadrature rules that are generated by blends, you have an infinite family of them, so you can uh, get different ones from what's available on Stack Overflow and JEG and these other kinds of things. So it makes for unique assignments. And of course, it's a topic in approximation theory. All right, what is it really? Um, suppose we have uh, m plus one Taylor coefficients at one end of the interval and n plus one Taylor coefficients at the other. By use of a linear transformation z equals a plus s times b minus a, we can scale the interval to the unit interval, the zero less than or equal to s less than or equal to one. This requires uh, scaling the co Taylor coefficients using the chain rule. And we just assume that this has been done. So if you do that, then you can show that the grade m plus n plus one polynomial, grade is a upper bound on the degree, so the degree of the polynomial is no higher than m plus n plus one. So this polynomial, but given by this formula, which has got binomial coefficients in it, and it's each term is polynomial in s, s to some power times one minus s to another power times pj. And here we've got minus one to the j's times qj's and a similar binomial coefficient and a similar s to something times one minus s to something in the second thing. So this definite polynomial, which we just write down analytically, turns out to have Taylor series matching the pj on the left and another Taylor series matching the qj on the right. So the uh, jth derivative evaluated at zero divided by j factorial is going to be pj for zero less than or equal to j less than or equal to m. And similarly, you'll match the qj's by taking evaluating the derivatives at s equals one. This formula was known to Charles Hermite. It's uh, in his uh, Cours de Analyse on page four. There is a potential difficulty. Those uh, binomial coefficients can get large. Here's the first 12. Uh, they go from two up to more than two million, almost three million. And for large k, uh, 2k choose k uh, is approximately uh, four to the k divided by root pi k. So these things grow rather quickly. For k equal 29 and k equals 515 in the above formula, uh, it exactly works out to 
bigger than the reciprocal of the machine epsilon in the first case and bigger than overflow in double precision in the second case. So we're going to have a limit on the size of the, the, the grade of the polynomials that we can use. But it's going to turn out to be actually pretty good. So here's how to use it for quadrature. Uh, each of those terms in the polynomial was of the form s to the something, 1 minus s to the something. And if you integrate that across the interval s from 0 to 1, you get it's just a beta function. So it's a ratio of gamma functions. And you can convert that in maple to uh, factorials or binomial coefficients or whatever you like. Here's what it looks like in factorials. So the integral from 0 to 1 of the blend is n plus 1 factorial over n plus n plus 2 factorial times a single sum, so linear combination of the pjs, and n plus 1 factorial over n plus n plus 2 factorial times another single sum of uh, binomial coefficient factorials times qj. So the previous formula for h of s was a uh, double sum. Maple has uh, is able to evaluate the inner sums once you replace the, the polynomial parts by that binomial coefficient. And of course, you can make a composite version of this formula by rescaling and integrating. Instead of from s equals 0 to 1, you integrate over the integral, interval xn to xn plus 1. And if you have m equals n equals 0, then you just get the trapezoidal rule. If you have m equals n equals 1, you get what's known as the corrected trapezoidal rule. For larger values of m and n, there are no names to the rules, but there's an infinite family of them. Well, that's a lovely formula, so maybe I should prove it for you. Well, I'm not going to do that. The proof takes seven and a half minutes, which I choose to use instead for examples. But if you really want a proof, uh, if you search on YouTube, Corliss two-point Hermit interpolation, or click the link that we've got here, you'll find a YouTube video. Uh, I'm going to turn the input on now. Uh, here I have an operator form of that double sum up there. Instead of using sum, I use add, so this is going to expect... Uh, so numerical values of for m and n, so it's going to execute these additions, but otherwise it's the same thing. So here is when we choose m equals 3 and n equals 4, so I've got uh, four coefficients known at the left and five coefficients known at the right, and I'm going to say my data is actually just symbols, p0 through p3 uh, and q0 through q4. So if I do that in the variable s, I get this polynomial, and you can see the binomial coefficients in them, and you can see that it's just s to the something times 1 minus s to the something. If you take the series of that at s equals 0, you get the correct series. If you take the series at s equals 1, you get the correct series again. And the grade of this polynomial uh, is the correct. m plus n plus 1 is 8, and Maple says, yeah, that grade is 8. We don't know what the degree is because the the, some of the Q's and some of the P's may be such that, that the leading coefficient of the blend actually is of lower degree. So the degree is something that we won't know uh, unless we specify the P's and Q's numerically. Well, if that formula is so old and it's so simple, what do we need maple for? Um, it turns out that if you want to evaluate that formula numerically, you really should do something a little better. Those binomial coefficients will cause problems unless you are careful. And it turns out that to be careful, all you need to do is convert to Horner form. Uh, I'll talk about automatic differentiation in, in a minute. And uh, there are other interesting things that you can take advantage of from the formula that you can factor the code nicely. And our code is contained in the workbook, and so you can have a look at it. So if we read it in, and the code is called Horner two-point Hermit interpolant which is a mouthful, so I'd much rather type blend, so we use a macro for blend. So if I say blend s from the interval 0 to 1, and I give symbolic p's and symbolic q's, I get what should be the same polynomial as what we just looked at in the previous example. It looks different. In particular, it looks like it has rational coefficients, 5 over 2 here, etc. But the 
there's a factor four in there so things can cancel. In general, I don't know how to write a, a blend in an integer way, but this is not for symbols, it's for numbers. And if you do it with numbers, well, then rational numbers are not gonna give us any trouble at all. So just to show you that the, the code that we wrote gives the same answer as before, we get the correct series at the left and the right, and it's the correct degree. Great. The most important thing in some people's mind uh, about computer programs is the cost. How expensive is this to evaluate? It turns out to be linear in the degree. And so here's just a, a collection of um, data of program to evaluate this. And it looks weird that we have two straight lines at the time, but of course, at some points, there's garbage collection happening. So we have these jumps of garbage collection time, but you can see that I, either with or without garbage collection, it's linear time. Uh, this is up to degree 1000 uh, on here, and just with a random Taylor series coefficients in there. I mentioned uh, di differentiation. If you have a function which evaluates uh, something numerically, you very frequently want the derivative. So how do we get derivatives out of this? Automatic differentiation of programs is very well-developed science now, and it's based on the usual rules of calculus. And Maple can do that. Uh, Horner's method code that we have written for this is actually simple enough so that we don't need to call Maple to differentiate it. We can write the code that provides the derivatives by hand, and so it's actually semi-automatic differentiation, but we use the same technique. Here's an example of actual automatic differentiation. Suppose I give this procedure here, and I call it Mandelbrot. It evaluates the, the nth Mandelbrot polynomial. Uh, it just has a simple recurrence in here that says p gets replaced by zp squared plus one. So starting with p equals zero, this produces a polynomial in p. Well, you might want its derivative. Uh, rather than writing it out in monomial form and taking the derivative that way, it's actually better to differentiate the program. So if we ask Maple's built-in d operator to differentiate it with respect to the second variable, that's z, in here it says, oh, no problem. There's the procedure, which is, has the same structure, just a few extra statements in it and a new variable, and it returns the derivative. There are lots of syntaxes for this. You can uh, improve this in a number of ways, or, uh, but our code uh, for blend allows differentiation to arbitrary order. So as an example of that, here is a, a function which has Taylor coefficients 1, 1, 1, 1 on the left, and one minus one, one minus one on the right, and we ask for the values of the blend and the values of the derivative of the blend and the values of the second derivative of the blend. So ender means that I want all derivatives up to and including ender equals two, and they get put into the zero component, the one component, and the two component uh, of a vector in the, in the result. So there we go. Um, the function there is plotted in black, the derivative is plotted in blue, and the second derivative plotted in red. Great, very convenient. One use, one main use for blends is to make simple approximations of complicated functions. There's lots and lots of ways of doing this, but this is a convenient way for some functions. Here, let's look at the reciprocal gamma function. And for a reference on the gamma function, I highly recommend the Chauvinet Prize winning paper by Philip J. Davis from 1959, Leonard Euler's Integral. Or you could see my paper with uh, the late John Borwin in 2018. But here we take F is the reciprocal of gamma. It's entire, it has Taylor series everywhere. We're gonna look at the interval minus one to zero. And uh, the function F is zero at both of those places. And we're going to, uh, evaluate this with m equals nine and n equals nine. So we're gonna be looking at uh, a grade nine plus nine plus one is usually 19 polynomial. Now, because the Taylor series coefficients that come out of uh, Maple's uh, formula are actually quite long and complicated things with zetas and whatnots in them, it actually pays us to evaluate those things to floating point numbers at higher precision than degree uh, 15, but this is kind of a one-time computation. Everything else we're going to do, we're going to do in 15 digits. 
So we take uh, 4,041 points, uh, 4,042 points actually on the intervals zero, pardon me, minus one to one, minus one to zero. And they're all hardware floats. And we evaluate uh, the polynomial, no derivatives, just the polynomial uh, on all of those uh, 4,042 points. And it takes less than a second, less than two thirds of a second to, to do that. And then I'm going to ask for uh, the reference values. So these are the, if I'm evaluating the built-in reciprocal gamma function at each of those 4,042 points. And now I compare my blended points with the reference points. And I do that relative to the size of the rest. So this is the relative error in the blended point computed in 15 digits. The graph looks different if you compute this, if you compute the reference point in higher precision, uh, but it looks pretty good in uh, 15 digits. You can see that the, the error is almost everywhere, relative error almost everywhere less than 10 to the minus 15. It's only just near the interval zero that, that uh, there's some sort of numerical instability a little bit crawling up, make the error go up to about 10 to the minus 13. But this is uh, uh, actually quite a reasonable answer. We get double precision accuracy across the, most of the, the interval. And it may be that this is an artifact of uh, uh, measurement error anyway, but for whatever reason, it's pretty good. In the next section, I uh, discuss the rate of convergence of blends but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that section as well. To look at numerical stability, I use a ludicrous grade interpolant. So remember, k equals 29 was bad. k equals 515 caused overflow. Here I'm going to take m and n so large that uh, m plus n plus 1 is 1,000. So we're almost at the overflow threshold. But even so, there's no problem. It just works. Uh, in fact, the Horner form is ludicrously stable. So we take M to be 368. We're working in 15 digits, uh, just double precision. Uh, N is 631, so M plus N plus 1 is 1,000. And I'm going to let the coefficients that left be just the geometric series coefficients, 1, 1, 1, all the way up to M. On the right, I have Taylor series coefficients, which alternate in sine and divide by I plus 1. So that's going to be some kind of logarithm. I evaluate this at 64 points uh, uh, on the interval zero to one in hardware precision. And this takes under two seconds, these degree 1000 polynomial evaluated 63 times. And I ask for, oh yeah, I'm actually asking for the function values, the derivative and the second derivative as well. So again, this is a lot of work that it does, but it does it reasonably fast. And just for comparison, we do it again in th at 30 digits. And this takes longer, almost five seconds. And now we lot, plot the difference between the 15 digit result and the 30 digit result. And the 15 digit result is correct essentially to 13 places. And if you think about it, 13 digits is the best you can expect out of a degree 1000 polynomial. And it's, the error is everywhere small, smaller than that. So just so you can see what the results are, here's the value of the function in blue, the value of the derivative up, and we have a fairly sharp corner in here. And of course, I've asked uh, the blend code to do something that's impossible. There is no analytic function which has Taylor series like geometric series on the, on the left, and it has Taylor series like this logarithmic function on the right. I'm matching two different functions. So something has to go bonkers, but you can see that the function actually did quite a nice job. So what is that function? It, I said it's a logarithm, it's a log z over z minus one. So what Maple says that sum is. And if you plot the two functions, one over one minus z for the geometric series, and this log z over z minus one, you can see that the blend really does a nice job. And as for why it intersects, uh, why it uh, chooses to go right there instead of uh, calling someplace else, well, it's because that's where the two curves intersect. I'm going to end by a discussion of how to plot a picture like the one on the title page, so, you know, that colored flag-like thing. So here we take a modest degrees 
M and N be both being eight. The one on the title page was actually five and eight. The Taylor series on the left is the Taylor series for the constant function minus one. So its value is minus one and all the derivatives are zero. On the right, the value is plus one and all the derivatives are zero. So again, I'm trying to match two analytic functions which don't match. So I'm asking blend to do something impossible. It says, you know, well, I'll do the best that I can. And you can see that it says, all right, you've got flat here, flat there, and I have to smoothly go from one to the other. So very nice job without overshoots or anything like that. It's degree 17, eight plus eight plus one, uh, which is fine. Now, if we do what's called complex plot 3D, uh, and we look at it from the top down, orientation equals minus 90, zero, we see all these colors. What are these colors? The colors are chosen on the argument of the function. This is the blend evaluated at a complex uh, value of s, s equals uh, minus two minus i up to two plus i, so all over the, the, the complex plane up in, in, in that rectangle. And the Coloring by the argument gives you what's known as a phase plot, and you can learn how to interpret that. It's very, really a very useful kind of plot. You should see the book by Elias Wiegert on uh, the use of phase plots in complex variables. I highly recommend that book. Now, uh, my co-author suggested that we uh, uh, plot with contour one here, and what's being plotted on the vertical axis, which you can't see until, until I rotate this, is the absolute value of h. And so the contour, where the contours are one, is plotted here. So that this says the function is going to be have magnitude one there. It has a little mess up in the middle because it's really close to being one there, and the, the grid isn't fine enough for it to do, to discover that. But I like the the image because it looks like we've got two little daisies on there. Uh, <laughs> And the function is trying to be minus one everywhere where it's red here, and it's trying to be plus one everywhere it's blue. So these contours where the magnitude is one is probably where the function is actually exactly one. And likewise, this is probably where the functions are actually exactly uh, minus one. But if we rotate this, we would see that it's actually a three-dimensional plot, but I like it very much the way that it is, so I'm gonna leave it that way. So I would like to thank John Butcher for teaching me how to use the contour integral method for finding interpolants. It's just a lovely technique. Uh, this work was supported by NSERC. This video was recorded using Camtasia and Western has a license for this, which is provided by Western Science. And thanks also to David Jeffrey for the loan of a good webcam. And thank you all for listening.